Um, my name is Ian okay. Hyde. Um, I'm a PhD researcher from the uh, okay. Digital Design Studio, which is a uh, part of Glasgow School of Art. Um, my research focuses on the effect of stage acoustics on um, on performing musicians, and over the years, it's been kindly funded by uh, Arup, um, who have had the opportunity to work with on numerous occasions, mainly in the the Glasgow Sound Lab. So. Um, I'm particularly excited to be here in Manchester to see, to see the, the newest addition to the, the Sound Lab family. Uh, before, I forget, before I begin, I'd like to thank both the University of Salford and Art for um, hosting and organising such a, an interesting event. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, all the presentations in the next uh, couple of days. Um, so my talk today focuses on the use of um, oralisation on, um, in, in stage acoustics. So um, by asking uh, musicians to play in different acoustic environments, uh, it's possible to infer the acoustic attributes that are responsible for a favourable acoustic environment. Uh, by understanding these attributes, it's hoped that uh, future stage, um, stage enclosures can be designed so that uh, musicians have a favourable environment to play in. Um, so, oralisation is becoming a more popular tool in, in, in this field, and um, it, it allows researchers to um, uh, place the mus musicians in uh, very controlled conditions. And, um, and so this is, this is basically the topic of, of my talk today. So I'm going to start with some uh, motivation behind um, uh, stage acoustic research, why we're, we're setting up an oralization system. I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, uh, impulse responses were measured on, on stages uh, for, for oralization and for analysis. Uh, I'm then going to describe the, um, the interactive oralization system that we built to, to help um, perform some perceptual testing. Uh, and as part of this, um, uh, one of the one of the challenges that we had with um, uh, with with buildings that the oralization system was solved by using parametric processing of uh, the the uh, the impulse responses. So I'm going to um, touch on that. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, finish this off by um, discussing a few of the future directions for um, for stage acoustic oralization, and then uh, later on uh, I've got a, a demo in the sound lab, which I'll hope you'll uh, come and have a look at. So it's widely understood that uh, musicians will adjust their performance technique based on the acoustic feedback that they receive on stage. For some musicians, this is an entirely subconscious uh, action that they don't realize um, that they're, they're making uh, conscious, conscious changes to their technique. But for others, the uh, acoustic feedback is such an, uh, an important part to them that they feel it's uh, an inherent part of their musical instrument. And so these musicians are um, highly sensitive to, um, to reflections and to um, the, the acoustic, the acoustic uh, feedback they receive and will make um, uh, various creative um, adjustments to uh, perhaps their articulation or technical adjustments to their, um, their instrument, for instance, um, changing the strength of a reed for a wind instrument. Um, so um, if acoustics are so important to the musician, it's quite surprising then that, they're, that, that there's not very... The, the, it's not very well understood what, um, what favorable acoustic conditions are for a musician. Um, and this is the fundamental drive behind um, stage acoustics. Um, if the, if the, the acoustic conditions are favorable for the musician, then everyone benefits. The, the audience get a be be better performance um, out of the musician, and the musicians are no longer um, expected to put up with working in poor conditions. Um, so um, my research um, focuses on a specific part of this, uh, which aims to determine if the spatial or temporal distribution of early reflections influence a musician's impression of the, the, the space. Um, if these are found to be uh, salient uh, aspects, then uh, it means that, that a new approach to uh, uh, assessing and designing stage enclosures uh, is needed. So one way of approaching this would be to invite musicians to play in, uh, in, in actual performance spaces, and uh, from their responses, um, try to understand if there's a correlation with um, with any um, of the the objective parameters that we've that we've measured. Um, the, this this, however, is is quite problematic as um, there's there's uh, very little control over non-acoustic factors um, such as the lighting or the temperature of the space, uh, and uh, it's very difficult uh, to actually control the, the 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 distribution of reflections in in actual venues because you'd end up having to um, uh, tear apart walls and uh, and um, use the use the venue occupy the venue for a number of days. So we decided that um, a, a virtual environment was uh, a good way to, to perform some perceptual testing uh, to, to understand more about how musicians react under these different conditions. Uh, the, the, the research involved uh, three different stages. So the, the first was to do a, a, a detailed survey of eight concert hall stages around Scotland, 
uh, using an ambisonic microphone to capture the spatial response at uh, different, um, different locations around uh, different stages. Uh, we then developed a number of acoustic parameters to describe the distribution of reflections in space and time. And then we developed uh, an interactive listening test with musicians who were invited into the sound lab to uh, then get their feedback on, um, uh, regarding these, these different uh, conditions. Um, and um, for this talk, it's, it's really the, the, the measurement and the, uh, the oralization system that I'd, I'd like to focus on. Um, so to start with, the, the first step is to uh, measure the impulse responses. Uh, and the aim for the, the surveys was to, um, was to get impulse responses that were appropriate for oralization and for analysis as well. Um, and we, um, we, we me took measurements uh, at different positions on stage that were representative of different performance, um, per performance um, uh, locations. And um, we also decided to use uh, quite an unusual setup for uh, measuring the impulse responses. So as you can see, we have um, the ambisonic microphone that's positioned directly above the uh, a directional loudspeaker. Um, the, the impulse response is measured uh, using um, uh, a logarith logarithmic sign sweeps that are played through the, the, the speaker and then measured using the ambisonic um, microphone. And then after each measurement, the, the loudspeaker is rotated by 45 degrees. Um, so there, for each position, there are eight uh, different impulse responses uh, describing the acoustics at that point. The thought behind this was that the, um, the, by using a directional sound source, uh, it, it provides us with a sparse representation of an impulse response, which we found to be uh, a lot easier to, to uh, analyze in terms of where the reflections are, are arriving from. Uh, and we decided that the, having a, a directional sound source was, was more representative of, uh, of, a, of an actual mu a musical sound source uh, than using a, an omnidirectional sound source. Uh, this is in step with the research that's been doing, been done in, in alto using uh, loudspeaker orchestras to represent different um, loud, uh, musical instruments in, in an orchestra. Um, additionally, um, it was hoped that we should be able to um, combine the, uh, uh, the impulse responses to later control the, 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 the directivity of the actual impulse response used for the oralization uh, by, by um, summing and, and adjusting the gains and phases of, of um, each measurement. Uh, but we unfortunately couldn't get it to work, so um, we, we used the individual um, uh, impulse responses in, in the oralization. And so this is um, a representation of the, the, the oralization system. Um, so you can see a test participant here seated uh, on, in the sound lab uh, with a, a wooden floor representing the, 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 the stage floor. Um, the, the direct sound from the instrument is captured by a microphone, which is then, um, which is then convolved in real time with, uh, with the impulse responses that we've measured on stage. Uh, these are split into early and, and late times to give us a little bit more control over the, the, the acoustic conditions. And then the, the, the resulting signals are played back over a loudspeaker array uh, to give the, the musician the impression that they are playing in, in the actual space. Um, so straight away you might be able to see that there are a, a number of, of, of interesting challenges here. Uh, one, for instance, is the processing latency. Uh, if the, the reflections are arriving at the, the, the wrong time, then, uh, then it, 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 can, um, it, it doesn't, doesn't sound right at all. Um, having a live microphone within the um, loudspeaker array introduces the risk of having uh, unwanted feedback. Um, there are issues regarding the, the um, coloration due to the, the microphone in the different loudspeakers. And also uh, to do um, with the, the, sp the spatial resolution of the, of the um, oralized sound field, remembering that we've um, taken these measurements in first order ambisonics. Um, additionally, the musician um, is, is not technically a fixed listener, and um, as they play, will tend to move around the impulse, or move around the sweet spot. And for those of you who've, who've listened to first order ambisonic uh, oralizations, uh, this can cause uh, phasing and coloration as the, the musician moves around. Um, if you combine these challenges together and you you um, you kind of uh, you you oralize the the the, the stage uh, uh, suboptimally, I suppose, um, you you get what we've been referring to as the PA effect, where the musician doesn't feel feel as if they are playing naturally into the virtual space. Rather, they feel like they're playing over a PA system in the space. And so uh, we 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 were tr we we try to re reduce the the um, the impact of these to, to make sure that they felt um, uh, a lot more uh, that they were playing naturally into the space. So the one that I, I want to focus on, well, the two two aspects I'd like to focus on are these these two: um, the spatial resolution of the sound field and the the musician moving around the sweet spot. 
Um, so again, I, I, I mentioned that the um, the uh, when the musician moves around the, the sweet spot, um, they, they uh, hear a lot of um, phasing and coloration. And this is due to uh, when first order amphisonic signals are played over loudspeakers, the, the signals are highly correlated. And so, so it's, it's, it's straightforward to, to, to understand that there would be a lot of um, phasing and coloration. Um, additionally, the, um, the, the first order ambisonic impulse response has uh, is, is an, a known limitation that um, it's got a very low spatial um, resolution. And so we, we attempted to solve both of these problems by using uh, parametric processing, um, which is um, uh, the um, common, common um, uh, implementations of this are known as uh, SEER and DIRAC and also HARPEX. And these, um, these techniques aim to uh, analyze the, the sound field to determine the direction of arrival and diffuseness of a sound source and then recreate the sound field uh, using the original B format and the, um, the, 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 the analyzed metadata. Um, so the analysis uh, looks a little bit like this. So the, from, from the, the, the B format impulse response, the, the energy and the intensity are estimated from the B format signals, and that gives us the uh, direction of arrival and the diffuseness of, uh, of, of, of the reflections. Um, this metadata accompanies the, the B format, which is then um, decoded over the R loudspeaker array, and um, then um, uh, the, 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 uh, the reflections that are identified as being uh, non-diffuse are uh, recreated using uh, amplitude panning, so um, the um, uh, vector-based amplitude panning is applied, um, so that reflections are, are generally um, uh, spatialized using only uh, three loudspeakers for a, a particular um, reflection. And um, uh, crucially, the diffuse sound is um, oralized using uh, decorrelated speaker feeds, which is implemented using um, phase randomization. And uh, the upshot of this is that it allows the um, the musician to move their head around the sweet spot and uh, have a reduced a reduced uh, uh, effect of, of the correlated speaker signal. So it, it's they, they they are freed up a lot more to, to, to play and not have to worry about staying still the entire time. Uh, in addition, the the use of um, amplitude um, panning for the the, the reflections um, uh, results in a perceived increase in spatial resolution. So uh, this we were quite keen to sort of push the use of this in, in our research. Um, there are a few other advantages to this technique. So the, there's an opportunity to uh, manipulate the, the parametric data um, to, to um, for instance, respatialize a reflection or uh, change the, the diffuseness or, or filter it out completely, uh, which means that there's, uh, it, it, it provides us with a, a, lot, a lot more um, uh, flexible system for, for, for use in research. And um, uh, also the, the, the parametric data that's, from the, that's taken from the analysis um, side can also be used to, uh, to uh, produce a, an image source plot, which allows us to analyze the, the, the temporal and spatial distribution of the early reflections. Um, however, there are a few drawbacks to this. Um, so the, uh, the, the amplitude panning um, can, can um, the amplitude panning technique requires a fairly dense loudspeaker array. So in our system, which is, is in layout identical to the, the sound lab here, uh, there are four speakers um, above, then eight, eight speakers at ear height, and then four below. Uh, when reflections arrive from above, they tend to, they tend to uh, gather around particular loudspeakers. When they arrive laterally, they are, are actually spatialized very well. Um, so um, uh, the, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, you, you need um, slightly more loudspeakers to, to um, accurately spatialize the uh, reflections coming in from the top. Um, also, crucially, the, the, uh, the whole system uh, relies on an accurate intensity estimation. Um, so um, unfortunately, for when you use a, a, an ambisonic microphone for this, the, the intensity estimation is found only to be accurate up to around 5 kilohertz, um, which, which means that the, the, the content above that is spatially spread um, and is also um, uh, uh, rendered at a, at a lower level because the, the system assumes that it's, it's diffuse. Um, so we, we got around that by uh, manipulating the metadata, as I've described, so that uh, reflections, um, the, 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 the intensity um, vectors will all sort of point in the same direction at all frequencies. Um, there is another issue with this, which is um, that th when coincident reflections occur from different directions, the, um, the, the intensity uh, vectors point at the vector sum of these two reflections, uh, rather than towards each reflection as you would like. And this is something which is, is actually being uh, looked at quite heavily in, uh, in, in Alter University for sure. 
Um, there are um, there are a number of different alternatives. Uh, for instance, using an intensity probe to um, measure the the, um, the impulse responses, or to use a higher order ambisonic mic or some other um, microphone uh, front end. Um, so a few uh, future developments for, for the interactive polarization <coughs> system. So again, I've, I've kind of touched on a few of these already. So uh, the first is um, that you can uh, manipulate the, 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 the metadata to oralize different, different scenarios. This is a very useful thing for um, if, for instance, you, you can't uh, go out and measure in lots of different spaces. It allows you to, to um, uh, take impulse responses and customize them to create specific um, stimuli. Um, the um, the use of um, uh, multiple microphones to capture the direct sound for the in interactive oralization side of it. So uh, you may have noticed that I've used a single microphone to capture the the, the direct sound, uh, which which um, unfortunately means that the musician um, uh, has to has to face in a certain direction uh, from for most of the time. Um, so uh, a, a microphone array would um, would assist in in capturing a, a more um, a more complete uh, picture of the, the the direct sound from from the from the instrument. Um, again, uh, something that we we un we would like to have, have, have done for this research was to um, is to um, include aspects of controllable source directivity for the the impulse response. So um, uh, by using um, uh, some kind of uh, spherical harmonic uh, technique, um, which I believe is starting to be used uh, with. Uh, <coughs> Um, a, a very um, specific um, uh, loudspeaker array. It's possible to get um, speci um, specific um, directivities that you can use to tailor oralizations for specific musicians. Um, some um, other researchers are looking at um, augmented stage acoustics, so using a kind of intelligent um, uh, foldback, if you will, um, where um, certain reflections, where the musicians are playing in real environments, and then certain reflections are being um, are, are recreated um, using a loudspeaker array. Um, other, other um, again, other other researchers are looking at um, uh, audience oralization and the effect of um, what what the reaction of an audience might be on a musician. So, um, for instance, it can it, it's um, I believe there's a, a system in the Royal College of Music that's capable of um, of simulating a full house, a very appreciative audience, or a, a very negative boo kind of audience, like, um, a rowdy crowd. Um, so this this allows researchers to to get um, to understand a bit more about what it's like to be the performer. Um, and furthermore, um, the oralization techniques could be used to allow musicians to uh, view their performance from a remote location. So they use the interactive oralization system to, uh, to play um, as they would on the stage, and then uh, they use uh, a different impulse response to simulate what it's like to be in the audience. So the, the music, musician gets the opportunity to hear the, the result of, 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 of what, they, what they're doing in practice. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to um, close off by just describing the the, the audio demo that I'm, I've got planned. Um, so um, it's it's going to be in the sound lab, and it's a comparison of, of three different concert halls from the perspective of the musician, uh, and the position is uh, downstage center on stage. Uh, I'm comparing the the Reed Hall of University of Edinburgh, the younger hall in the University of St Andrews, and the Ledger Recital Room, which is uh, the, in part of the the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland in, in Glasgow. Uh, so there, there'll be uh, an iPad which allows you to um, change between the different um, different uh, acoustic scenarios, and uh, there's a live microphone in there, so you can uh, you know talk and shout and sing if you like into the uh, the into the system to hear what it sounds like. But I know that mainly maybe maybe you don't want to to, to be so boisterous on the first day. So um, I've created a, a virtual musician which is actually a loudspeaker. Um, which is playing anechoic audio and is being processed by the, the system, so you should be able to get an, an appreciation as to how uh, it sounds like for um, a musician on stage. And thank you very much.